This is the story of time and symbols. They loved each other, but didn't know how to sink between them, how to get along. Reality was becoming more complicated what resulted in their quartz ticking faster, their maps getting fuzzier and their compass twirling. All this made their life together much harder. Reality and ignorance affected both in different ways, but also affected the quality of the labels they were able to design while creating sets. Symbols was too unpredictable in some situations, and time was all about indexing events and in certain moments couldn't follow Symbols' train of thoughts. Some sequences made sense for both, but sometimes they found other sequences that gave the impression of being manipulated by ignorance to feel wrong for both, to make them feel confused. Buckle up, because today we're really stretching our brains. We're diving into a world where numbers aren't just sitting there. They're like little bundles of action. Yeah, it's a pretty wild concept. It really is. And we've got some seriously cool source material to dig through talking about numbers as actions. It's definitely a brain bender. But it all comes down to this area of math called group theory. Group theory. Okay, that sounds kind of intimidating. Let me try to make it a little easier to grasp. Please do. Picture a simple square. Now rotate it, say, like 90 degrees. Got it. So you're doing something to that square, moving it around. That's an action, right? Totally. Like We're manipulating it in the real world. And that's what group theory dives into. It helps us see how these actions, these transformations, they're deeply connected to how numbers themselves like act and interact. So there's this hidden layer of action inside numbers. Exactly. Wow. Does this mean that things like adding or multiplying those basic math operations are also actions in this way of thinking? Right on. When we add or multiply, we're not just like, I don't know, moving static symbols around on a page. We're doing things, performing actions that change those numbers in very specific ways. And get this, our source material takes it even further and introduces us to something called monads. Monads. Okay, now you're speaking my language. A little cryptic, a little mysterious. Lay it on me. What are they all about? Think of them as these little containers. They hold information and can actually act on that information based on certain rules. Okay, so far so good. The source material uses them to build a sort of a toy universe. It's a simulation. Hold up, toy universe. That's a pretty ambitious project. How do they pull that off? So picture each of these monads as a tiny particle in this simulated universe. The particles interact based on the rules that define the monads, the mathematical rules. Okay, I'm following. And here's the really mind-blowing part. The way these monads behave, it can actually create incredibly complex structures, kind of like how those basic laws of physics create all the complexity we see in our own universe. You know, it makes me think about those simulations they do of galaxies forming, you know, mm -hmm. just starting with gas and dust. But we're not talking about gravity or dark matter here, right? This is all about numbers. You got it. But that's part of what's so amazing. We're seeing these cool connections between this abstract world of math and the actual physical world we live in. I like it. And the source material gets even more intriguing. They start bringing in visuals. They use colors to represent different dimensions of information within these simulations. Ooh, okay, now you've really piqued my interest. I'm a visual learner, so the uh -huh. idea of visualizing numbers, sign me up. It's like we're closing the gap between these abstract symbols and something we can see with our own eyes and maybe even start to understand on a gut level. So how does this whole thing work? It's similar to like how we use color in data visualizations, you know, you can represent additional variables that way. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Think about like uh, mapping musical notes onto a circle and each note gets its own color. Okay. As a melody plays, you wouldn't just see a boring old line, right? You'd see these dynamic patterns popping up showing the connections between the notes. Man, that's such a cool way to think about it. Now I'm looking at music in a whole new light. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Our source material also uses these fantastic spiral visuals to show how periodicity works in number sequences. Spirals. Mm. Periodicity. This is giving me flashbacks to high school geometry, and I don't hate it. Right. Tell me more. Picture this. You've got a spiral that just keeps looping around a central point. Okay, I get the visual. That visual nails the idea of periodicity, a pattern that repeats itself over a certain interval. And this is where understanding the difference between continuous time and discrete time comes into play. Oh, I think I'm starting to get a little lost. <laughs> Imagine a smooth, unbroken wave, you know, like an ocean wave. That's continuous time. But a lot of times... In real life, say in digital audio, you're not capturing that whole wave. Instead, you're taking samples of it at specific moments, right? That gives you a discrete representation. 
And that's where sampling frequency comes in, how often we take those snapshots. It becomes super important. It's like making sure you have enough pixels in a digital image so it doesn't look all blurry. Exactly. I know a little about this. Isn't there some kind of rule about it? The Nyquist-Shannon theorem. Yeah, that's yeah. the one. It's all about making sure you can actually recreate the original signal accurately from those samples. You nailed it. And it highlights this fundamental problem when you're trying to visualize certain numbers, especially irrational numbers. Right. Our source material goes deep on this challenge. Ooh, okay. Here's where things get really interesting, right? Now we're in the territory of pi and the golden ratio. Those never-ending, non-repeating decimals that are everywhere in nature, from sunflowers to those spiral galaxies. But how do you visually capture something that's literally defined by its refusal to repeat? That's the million-dollar quotient. Irrational numbers with those infinite, non-repeating decimals, they kind of mess up the neat periodicity we see in those spiral visualizations. So it's like trying to fit an infinitely long, totally random object into a finite space. No wonder it's a challenge. Exactly. It's like fitting a square peg into a round hole. It just doesn't quite work. Okay, I see the problem. But there's got to be some way around it. <laughs> there is. And it comes from this super clever solution from a mathematics stack exchange thread. Instead of trying to show the entire irrational number visually, you know, perfectly, we can use what are called rational approximations. Okay, break that down for me a bit more. It's like saying, okay, we can't capture this infinite non-repeating decimal exactly, but we can get super close by using a fraction with some seriously huge numbers on top and bottom. I'm starting to get it. So it's like an approximation, but a really, really good one. Exactly. And when they plug these incredibly precise fractions into their equations, guess what happens? They can make these mesmerizing spirals that are almost perfectly periodic. Almost periodic spirals. Mm. Man, that sounds like we're venturing right to the edge of the mathematical unknown. We are. And you know what's even cooler? This whole idea of using shapes and spaces to visualize math concepts, it leads us to this super trippy visualization that pops up in the Stack Exchange discussion, the Mobius Strip. The Mobius Strip. Wow, now you're speaking my language. Yeah. It's like math is showing us that there are hidden dimensions all around us. Hmm. But before we get totally lost in Mobius Strip land, maybe we should take a breather here. We've covered a ton already. You're right. We've barely scratched the surface of this amazing world where numbers can move and groove and transform. It's mind-blowing. But that's what makes this whole deep dive so exciting. There's always more to discover, ready to jump back into those twists and turns of how we visualize numbers. Oh, you know I am. I'm still thinking about that Mobius Strip thing. It's like math is full of these secret dimensions just waiting for us to find them. Exactly. And it's amazing how this journey of exploring numbers through shapes and spaces, it always seems to bring us back to those really fundamental math concepts. It's all connected. Exactly. Remember those uh, almost periodic spirals we were talking about? The ones you get when you use those rational approximations for irrational numbers? How could I forget? It's like they're trying to capture the shadow of something infinitely complex. What if I told you this whole dance between those rational approximations and irrational numbers? It's not just some mathematical curiosity. It actually pops up in all sorts of fields, even music. Okay, now you've really got my attention. I'm not exactly a musician, but I love it when you find these connections between seemingly totally different things. Think about the circle of fix. It's the super important idea in music theory that maps out how different musical keys relate to each other. Right, right. I've heard of it. So imagine you take all 12 notes of a musical scale and put them in a circle. If you go around the circle in perfect fifths, that's a specific musical interval, you'd think you'd eventually land back on the note you started with after going all the way around. Right, yeah. That makes sense. It's a circle. It should loop back around. You'd think so, right. But here's the catch, the real frequencies of musical notes. When you look at them mathematically, they involve those same irrational numbers we've been talking about. Get out. It's true. Which means no matter how many times you go around that circle of fifths, you'll never land back on the exact starting frequency. There's always this tiny difference because of how those irrational numbers work. Wow, I had no idea music had this whole hidden layer of math. Yeah. So even in music, which seems so harmonious and beautiful, those irrational numbers are there in the background messing things up just a little. Exactly. It's like the, the universe just loves to remind us that there's always more to the story than we might think. I love that. And it makes me think about that term from the source material. Yeah. Almost periodicity. 
This thing with the musical notes, it's connected to that idea, right? 100%. Almost periodic functions. Yeah. They're these fascinating mathematical objects that show patterns that almost repeat, but never quite perfectly. It's like they remember what it's like to be periodic, but there's this built-in unpredictability there too. It's like they can't quite make up their mind. Exactly. And this links directly back to that circle of fifths. The notes almost make a repeating pattern, but then those irrational numbers come in and throw in a little curveball, making the music that much more interesting. It's like they add a little spice, a little bit of, you never know what's going to happen next. <laughs> Speaking of, you never know what's going to happen next. The source material also mentions something called Cantor's Dust and the Sierpinski Triangle. Any chance we could <laughs> unpack those a bit? Absolutely. They sound a little intimidating, even for a deep dive like this. Don't worry, they're not as scary as they sound. Basically, they're great examples of fractals, those geometric shapes that have this amazing property. They look the same at different scales. You zoom in on a fractal and you see a smaller version of the same pattern. Zoom in again, there it is again. This infinite nesting of patterns is part of what makes them so captivating. Right. I've seen those images of fractals. They're mesmerizing. But how do Cantor's dust and the Sierpinski triangle fit in with everything else we've been talking about, like periodicity and irrational numbers? That's where it gets even cooler. You can actually describe how to construct these fractals using these simple repetitive processes that are closely related to get this binary counting. No way. The same kind of binary counting that makes computers work. The one and only. And here's the kicker. The patterns that pop up in these fractals, they often show that same kind of almost periodicity we were just talking about. So are you saying there's some underlying connection between the structure of numbers, the patterns we see in nature, and even how we organize information? You're getting it. It's like there's this hidden language of patterns that connects everything. Okay, my brain is officially doing backflips. <laughs> We've gone from numbers that act to visualizing data with rotating histograms and orbits to cracking the musical code and wrestling with the limits of how math can represent the world. And we're just getting started. You're kidding, there's more. There's a whole lot more to uncover about how our source material visualizes those complex number sequences. Well, don't leave me hanging. I am so ready for more mind-bending visualizations. You know, after that last segment, I'm starting to think we could spend a lifetime exploring these hidden connections between numbers, patterns, and the universe. It's a rabbit hole for sure. It really is. But for now, let's get back to our source material. One thing that really struck me was how much they focus on finding new ways to visualize those complex number sequences. It's like they're trying to decode a secret language. They're using these visual metaphors to help us understand something that exists beyond what we normally see. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they've come up with some really inventive approaches, I have to say. Yeah. One term jumped out at me, rotating histogram. Now, I know a little something about histograms, you know, those bar graphs that show how data is distributed. But how do you rotate a histogram? That sounds like something out of a Salvador Dali painting. It's actually this really neat visualization technique. They've kind of barred it from the world of data analysis and given it their own spin. I like it. So how does it work? Imagine taking a regular bar graph, but instead of the bars going up and down, you wrap them around a circle like spokes on a wheel. Okay, I think I can picture that. Yeah. So each bar still represents how often something happens, but its position on the circle, that gives you even more information, right? Exactly. So the length of the spoke tells you the frequency, you know, how often something occurs. And the angle of that spoke relative to the center of the circle, that encodes another piece of data. So it's a way of packing in extra information without making it too complicated to look at. Exactly. It's elegant. I like it. And it's kind of like those old radar screens you'd see in those classic sci-fi movies. Oh, yeah, with the arms souping around and the blips showing up. That's it. And just like those radar screens could keep track of a bunch of different objects at the same time, these rotating histograms let us see multiple variables at play within some really complex system. But our source material doesn't stop there. Oh, no, they take it even further and introduce discrete time orbits. Okay, now you're just messing with me. Orbits. That makes me think of planets and gravity, not number sequences. I know, I know. It sounds a little out there, but stay with me. Remember how we talked about sampling a continuous signal, like taking snapshots of a wave? Yep, capturing the essence of the wave at specific moments. Right. Now think about taking each of those snapshots and plotting them as a point on a circle. As you move from one snapshot to the next, you're essentially tracing out an orbit on that circle. 
So the points are like the sampled values yeah. and the shape of that orbit. Hmm. That tells us something about the underlying pattern of the data, right? That's so cool. It is. And it's a way for us to see periodicity or almost periodicity with fresh eyes. Plus, you can use color or other visual cues to represent even more layers of information, just like with the rotating histograms. It's like we're learning a whole new visual language for understanding complex systems. You got it. And speaking of complexity, there was one more thing I wanted to ask you about from the source material. They mentioned something called the Gibbs phenomenon. Any chance you could explain that one? It sounds kind of ominous. It's not ominous, really, but it is this interesting quirk that comes up in Fourier analysis. Okay, I'm not going to lie. My brain's starting to feel a little full right now. That's fair, but this is cool, I promise. So, say you've got this complex sound wave, like a musical note. Fourier analysis tells us we can break down that complicated wave into a bunch of simpler waves called sine waves. Each one has its own frequency and amplitude. It's like music is just math wearing a costume. Exactly. But here's where that Gibbs phenomenon comes in. When we use a limited number of these sine waves to try to represent a function that's got these sudden sharp changes, like a square wave, you get these little overshoots or ripples that show up near those sharp corners. So the math is doing its best to recreate that perfect square, but because it only has so many tools in its toolbox, it ends up with a slightly rounded version. Perfect analogy. And the fewer sine waves we use, the more obvious those little imperfections become. So frustrating. Nah. But it highlights how tricky it can be to accurately represent certain kinds of functions if you're only using a limited number of smooth curves. This is blowing my mind. Yeah. We've gone from numbers that act to using rotating histograms and orbits to visualize data, to deciphering the mathematical secrets of music, and then wrestling with the limitations of how math represents the world. And we just scratched the surface, really. It's incredible. And kind of overwhelming. It really is. It feels like we've only caught a glimpse of this vast, intricate world that mathematics creates. You've got that right, and that's what makes it so captivating. Every time we discover something new, every new visualization technique we come up with, it just opens up even more questions, pushing us to dig deeper into these mysteries of numbers and patterns and how our universe works. Who knows what other hidden dimensions are out there waiting for us to find them. It's a bit humbling, isn't it? Yeah. But so exciting at the same time. And to all our listeners out there, we hope this deep dive has really sparked your curiosity. Don't be afraid to explore these ideas on your own. Keep asking those big questions and never lose that sense of wonder because there's always something new to discover in the world of mathematics. Until next time, happy exploring, everyone.